Thank you, Brent. How true. The Lord Jesus said, didn't he, in John 15, without me you can do nothing. How necessary is he, his presence, his power. And uh, I hope you've had a, a wonderful day. I have. Got a little bit of walking in, the beautiful Oregon coastline. Got a little bit of reading in. I uh, bought um, Eric Metaxas' new book, Seven More Men, uh, which is a really good read, guys, uh, on uh, just seven great historical figures, Martin Luther, George Whitfield, uh, William Booth. And so I'm finding their life story and inspiration to mine. And I got some uh, fish and chips in around five o'clock. So it's been, a, it's been a good day, and I hope you've, you've, you've enjoyed it yourself. Although it struck me, and I think it would strike you, would it not, as we go about this uh, uh, town, that um, everybody around us is enjoying the creation. But that's not enough. Uh, we should be enjoying the Creator. Uh, the creation only points us to the Creator, the, the, the mystery of the ocean, the vastness of the horizon, the beauty of our surroundings, um, made by Him. We're made in His image. We're here to glorify Him, and I trust you'll do that uh, wherever you go. And uh, we're coming to the kind of high point of the day where we hear uh, His Word. I don't know if you know this, but um, Dawson Treitman, who uh, founded the Navigators, used to finish the day wherever he was, if he was somewhere else outside his home or he was in his home, he'd always say at the end of the day, in whoever's company he was, um, he'd always say, H-W-L-W, his word, the last word. And then he would read the scriptures and he'd either bid himself good night or he'd bid his guests good night. I think that's a good way to finish the day. His word, the last word. And uh, we're going to open it here in a moment, but I'm uh, just praying that this week uh, you'll be encouraged by these expositions. They'll be transformative in your life, and uh, that, that indeed that we will be changed by our encounter with the living Word of God. It wasn't a D.L. Moody, he said, the Bible's not just for information, it's for transformation. So I hope you just go, don't go ahead with a, go home with a swelled head, but a swelled heart. Uh, you're, you're in love with Christ all the more, and you want to live for His glory with, with greater, greater fervor. Um, I, was, I was laughing the other day, one of my heroes is Winston Churchill, and I was reading uh, something more of his life, and you may know that there were two particular ladies that didn't like him, and he didn't like them. There was Lady Ashter, who once famously said to him, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your tea. To which he famously replied, if you were my wife, I would drink it. Uh, there was another lady, Beth, Bessie Braddock, who uh, met Winston Churchill one night. He was drunk, and she was aghast, and she said to him, Mr. Churchill, you're drunk. And he, he looked at her and he said, I am, and you're ugly. But in the morning, I'll be sober, and you'll still be ugly. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty tough stuff right there. But I hope by the morning, you and I will be different. I hope that as we spend time in uh, this retreat area and God's Spirit uses His Word, that we will be transformed and those, the ugliness of our sin will recede and the beauty of the Lord Jesus uh, will grow more and more in each of our lives. If you'd like to connect with us, uh, we have a radio ministry that you can uh, connect with, ktt.org, if you want to listen to some of our broadcasts and, and some of the material that uh, might be there uh, for, for your benefit. Um, some of you have, have been, were here the last time I was here, um, just so that I'm not a stranger. Uh, I, I grew up in Belfast in Northern Ireland, I grew up in a Christian home, came to Christ when I was 16. Uh, through Matthew 24, 44, be ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. I knew the gospel. I knew I needed to repent, but I never did. I loved my sin. I was caught in the, in, in the pressure of the culture and my friends. But God in His grace um, wrestled me to the ground, brought me to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, for a time, I uh, worked in aerospace. I was an aircraft engineer for about nine years of my life. And for about three years Overlapping that, another three years beyond that, I was also a police officer in Northern Ireland in the Royal Ulster Constabulary during the, the height of the Troubles, which was a, an interesting experience in North Belfast. And then God called me to the ministry, 
went to the Irish Baptist College in Belfast. And during that time, I met my wife, June, who would love to have been here. But as I said, she's laid aside. She's my bonnie lassie. Uh, she's from Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, she came over to Northern Ireland to go to another Bible college. And uh, God brought us together, gave us, th- gave us three wonderful daughters. And uh, so um, we came in 1993 to the United States with no intention of staying. Uh, but God had other plans. We came out to go to the Master's Seminary under John MacArthur, and uh, God has kept us here ever since, and uh, we're enjoying it, loving it, and uh, we enjoy experiences like this. And so uh, just glad to be here and trust that what I share is a blessing to you. I was asked, do I, did I have any materials to bring? And I did. I brought one book uh, that I'd encourage you to take a, take a look at. Um, you know, it'll save my children from starvation and my wife from panhandling if you'll buy this. Uh, but it comes out of my experience as a police officer. Um, I have a little statement that's the basis of this book. It's that um, security is not the absence of danger. Security is the presence of God. If you were a police officer during the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland, you were more likely to be killed off duty than on duty. Uh, We would be shot at home. We would be blown up in our cars. We would be assassinated in shopping malls. I frankly hope those days aren't coming to the United States. We've had several officers assassinated. It's troubling days, but where do we find peace? Where does a police officer find peace? Where do you find peace in the midst of your troubles? Well, it's in the presence of God. And so I, I went through the Word of God, and I find different ways in which you and I can take cover in God's presence. Prayer, right? Philippians 4, the prayer, if we pray, the peace of God will guard our hearts. Ephesians 6, if we put on the whole armor of God, we're able to stand in the evil day. I even look at Romans 13. It's the government's job to punish evil and protect the good. I even have a chapter in here. I don't don't know of too many books that make an argument for the Christian's ability to to defend themselves. Um, and, And so there's other things in here that will help you take cover, finding uh, peace in God's protection. I think they're over at the bookstore. If we run out of them, I have a few more up in my room. I think they're $15. That's a conference price. It's a hardback. It's a really nice book. And, and not only buy one for yourself, can I encourage you to do this? And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not just doing this for self-promotion. Uh, we have said this at our church. If you know someone in law enforcement, buy them this book. Uh, encourage them with this book so that as they protect us, they might find God's protection over their own lives. So anybody in the military or in law enforcement, this is a real encouragement to them. It's written out of my own experience, and I think they can identify with that. So uh, take a look at that over at the bookstore. Well, let's uh, take our Bibles and turn to um, Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 um, or sorry, Colossians 3, verse 16, but I'm going to read verses 15 through 17. Remember what I've said. We're we're in a series across this week called Total Grace. I, I want you to understand that the grace of God will meet you at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of your Christian experience. Grace is not only the way into the Christian life, It's the way on in the Christian life. Grace is not only the the way into the Christian life, but the way on in the Christian life. It doesn't just meet us inside the doorstep of salvation. It's something that establishes, um, excites, energizes, and enables the totality of our Christian experience. Uh, what about 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8? Just think about this, where Paul says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have abundance for every good work. All grace, with all sufficiency, in all things, so that you might be able to do every good work. That's the abundance of God's grace promised to us. And we're going to look at um, God's grace, not only as saving grace, but last night we looked at 
strengthening grace. And tonight we're going to look at singing grace. And we'll look at a few more as the week progresses. But uh, I'll, let me read Colossians 3, verse 15 to 17, a message I've entitled, Join the Song. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Notice this, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Saving grace, strengthening grace. Now there is grace to worship God properly and passionately. My um, father-in-law in Scotland Gordon Elliott was brought to Christ in a factory in Scotland by a, a fellow worker who happened to be a believer. Uh, Gordon was a bit of a boy, as we say back then. And so when he got converted, it, it sent ripples throughout the factory. And he told me one day that, uh, that, that it, was, it was said of him throughout the factory that Gordon has become a hallelujah. That's how his conversion was described. Gordon has become a hallelujah. And I like that because it associates a man or a woman coming to Christ with the idea that they start to live a life that, that manifests a love for God in worship and in singing. The Bible would have us know that when someone finds the Lord Jesus Christ, along with him, they find their voice. They're given a voice of confession. They confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. But it's not just a voice of confession. It's a voice of celebration. The Lord not only becomes their salvation, but their song. Psalm 118, verse 14. You remember how it's described right in Psalm 40? When he saves us out of the Mary clay and puts our feet upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he puts a song in our mouth, even praise unto our God. Listen, God is too great, his love is too wonderful, and his grace is too amazing for us simply to talk about it. We've got to sing about it. That, that's natural for us. When you find a Christian, or when you find Christian, you'll find them singing. Psalm 34, verse 3, let us exalt his name together. What about Acts 2, verse 46 to 47, where we read on the day of Pentecost, how 3,000 souls were saved, and they immediately started congregating, and they immediately started praying and breaking bread and studying the apostles' doctrine and praising God and finding favor with man. Now, Christians sing. Grace produces a song. Although, let me say this by way of qualification. I remind our congregation of this all the time. We should all sing, but only a few of us should sing into a microphone. Amen? We just got to make that qualification. Uh, in fact, one of the men told me in our church a while ago, he has a prison ministry, and he was out preaching the gospel in a prison a while ago. And in, in an act of worship, he was at the microphone, and he started singing, put his hand up, closed his eyes. And a few minutes later, when he opened his eyes, one of the prisoners had moved the microphone about 20 feet away. I think he got the message. You're not much of a singer. Oh, we should all sing, but only a few of us should sing into a microphone. But we should certainly all sing. We should all join the song. And I want us to come and look at uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, because here we're given a rare window into New Testament worship. We sing of grace because of grace. And here we're told that the church at Colossae are to um, sing with grace in their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they express their love for him in song and in hymns and in psalms as the word of Christ dwells in them richly. Now let us again put the text in its context. We're jumping right in. We're parachuting right into the book of Colossians tonight. And if, if we're looking at these verses in their context, basically they're in a section about the conduct of a new man in the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ gets a hold of a life, change takes place. I had an old pastor in Northern Ireland who used to say, if there's no change, there's something strange. 
See, see, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you're born again, a transformation starts to take place. And here it's described as putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Did you notice that language? Verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Put off the old man with his deeds. You can't go back to the way you were living. You can't go back to your old life because you're now a new creature in Christ. And all these things begin to pass away. And the old is replaced with the new. And that's what we read in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And as a continuation of that, verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in your heart richly. Christ not only forgives people, he fixes them. He changes them. And alongside these virtues of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, he'll produce in someone a worshiping heart. If you don't like to sing, if you don't like to worship, you may want to take your spiritual pulse. Because when the word of Christ dwells in you richly, you'll sing. When Christ is at work in your life, you'll worship. So let's come and look at this text. Three things. We're going to see what I call singing on the Scriptures, singing on the saints, singing on the Savior. Look at singing on the Scriptures. Verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You'll see, and the point I'm about to make is that an exposition of God's word is the trigger for worship. When the word of Christ dwells in the believer richly, it produces singing. If you go to the book of Psalms, the psalmist says this, your statutes, your judgments, your law, your word has become my song. In fact, sometimes I wonder if we haven't got it back to front. We typically sing in our Protestant evangelical churches and then preach. I wonder if we shouldn't preach and then sing. Because that seems to be the order here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then sing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, what do we mean here, the word of Christ? What does is, what is that describe? What is, what is that um, telling us about? Well, in a, in a narrow historic interpretation, we could limit it to um, the words of, of, of Jesus and the Gospels, right? Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind the apostles of the things that he said. We know that John wrote down, according to chapter 20 and verse 31, the things he had heard from the Lord Jesus Christ. But I, I think that's too narrow an interpretation. I think the word of Christ is simply another way of describing the word of God because the Bible's theme is Jesus. Um, the Old Testament anticipates him. And the Gospels and the book of Acts record his words and his actions. And the epistles and the book of Revelation begin to anticipate his return a second time. E even if we um, narrowed it to the Gospels, the Old Testament leads up to the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament flows from the Gospels. So I think you and I can safely conclude that the Word of Christ is the Bible, the revelation of God's Son and God's love for us in the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ. Back to the text, verse 16. Let a lie make it so that the Word of God, the Bible, the Gospel of Jesus Christ dwells in you richly. The, the word dwell here literally means to take up residence. It means let the Bible, let the Gospel find a ready home in your heart. I, I love what we read about the, the Thessalonians and the, how that church was established. In chapter 1, verse 5, Paul looks back and he says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in the power and in the Holy, 
in the, in, in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what kind of manner of men we were among you. In chapter 2, verse 13, for this reason, we also give thanks without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. As Paul looks back on the establishment of this church, he understands that the preaching of the gospel brought about salvation in people's lives, and then they congregated around the person they had come to trust, Jesus Christ, and the word of God produced that. They received the word of God. They welcomed it. They, they made room for it. Their, their hearts were hospitable to the word of God. I hope that's true of you and me. I hope we're eager, eager to invite the word of God into our lives. Um, and we not only let it into our lives, we, we give it the run of the house. We let it speak to how we conduct ourselves in, in, uh, in all areas of our life. But here's the thing I find interesting. This word, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly, is in the plural. And you'll notice, too, that the singing is congregational. Sing and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's important that you grasp that because I'm going to go somewhere with this for a moment. It's addressed to congregants in the church at Colossae. This isn't addressed to individuals who are alone with God doing private devotions. This is a Sunday. This is the Lord's day. This is the gathering of the church on the first day of the week to break bread, to pray, to, to comprehend the apostles' doctrine. This isn't personal devotion. This is corporate worship. So what we're talking about here is preaching. When, when Paul says to the Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you all richly, the implication is you need to come together and hear an exposition of the word of God. This is at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. That's why after the Protestant Reformation, furniture in the church was moved. The altar was moved to the side and the pulpit was put to the center. Because the greatest sacrament is the sacrament of God's word. And the calling of every pastor is fundamentally to be a teacher and a preacher. That's how the pastoral epistles describe the role of a pastor. What is the one qualification for an elder in 1 Timothy 3 verse 2? Able to teach. What does Paul say to his young apprentice, Timothy? I want you to be diligent in your study of the word of God that you, you would be a workman who need not be ashamed rightly handling the text of God's word. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 1 and 2, preach the word in season and out of season. Any worship service worthy of the name Christian will have the Word of God at the center of it. And that's, what being, that's what's being described here. Preaching, exposition is not an intrusion on the worship service. One of the things that concerns me in this re uh, renaissance of worship in the evangelical church is something's wrong with the fact that as singing and, and worship rises, the word of God is being diminished. Pulpits are being set aside. The, the, the time to preach is being reduced and limited. There's something wrong with that. That's an inversion of the Bible. That's going in the wrong direction. It's the Word of God finding a home in our heart that produces true worship. True worship isn't closing your eyes and trying to imagine what God is like or finding a feeling. True worship is opening your eyes and your heart to the text of Scripture. And as you study it and comprehend it and know it, it dwells in your heart and the Spirit of God produces life in Christ, which leads to singing and worship. That's why God's people have always been a people of the book and the hymn book, the song book, because both go hand in hand. But the point is this, in the New Testament, the worship of God was always a response to the word of God. I have no idea, brother. 
So here's what we've got to see here. Preaching was not only a crucial part of worship, it created more worship. Preaching was not only a crucial part of worship, it created more worship. So what, what, what would I say in way of application for you to think through the obedience of your life in the light of God's Word? You're required to develop what I call expository listening. Have you ever thought about that? There's a lot of talk today about expository preaching. And I'm so thankful for that. That's why I traveled halfway across the world to go to the master's seminary to be taught the skill of expository preaching. But, but the congregation must develop the skill of expository listening. Preaching requires an equal partnership between the pulpit and the pew. The sermon is not a one-sided affair. Communication is a package deal. It requires a good speaker, but it requires a keen listener. You know, the average family driving to church may get around to the conversation on a Sunday morning. Well, you know, I wonder what the pastor will be like this morning. Well, I'm driving to church. I'm thinking about, I wonder what the congregation will be like this morning. Will they be awake? Will they be obedient? Will they have sat up to two in the morning and watched some stupid Netflix movie and they're coming to church tired and carnal and worldly and not alive to the Word of God and then they're going to give me a score of six out of ten. They're going to blame me when they're to blame. You get the point. Being a little facetious there, but you get the point. If you're going to get something out of the sermon, you've got to bring something to the sermon. You've got to invite, welcome the Word of Christ to dwell in your heart richly. You've got to prize God's Word, right? Psalm 19, verse 10. Is that how you come to the preaching of the Word and the public exposition of Scripture? You know what? The Word of God is more precious than gold. Sweeter than honey. Are you going to prioritize the word? Where Job says that I esteem your word more than my necessary food. Is that how you see the word of God? As Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the word of the, the word of the, the mouth of God. You can't wait for the gathering of the church and the public exposition of God's word. Are you prepared? To hear the word of God? Ezra 7 verse 10, you know what it says of Ezra? He prepared his heart to study the law and to do it. Do you prepare on a Saturday night? I remember growing up in a home when Christians used to prepare for Sunday worship on a Saturday. My father would lay his suit out. He would polish his shoes. He would lead our family in worship. And we would go to bed realizing that tomorrow morning is Sunday. It's the Lord's day. It's the gathering of the people of God where the Bible is going to be opened by a man gifted and skilled in its exposition that we might hear the word of the living God and live. There's got to be a prizing, a prioritizing, a preparing, a purging. James 1 verse 21 tells us to purge sin in our lives that we might receive the incorruptible seed of God's word. There's got to be praying. Psalm 119, what the psalmist says in verse 17 and 18, Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from out of your law. And finally, there's got to be presenting. Do you present yourself to the Lord on the Lord's day? You get up on a Sunday morning and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and you've slept well and you've prepared your heart well to go and hear the Word of God because nothing more important is happening on planet Earth at that moment than the opening of the Word. And you're going to come like little Samuel and when the preacher opens the Bible and says, open your Bible, you're going to say, Lord, speak your servant hears. Half the Christians that they don't even come with their Bibles. That's where we're at here. You want to worship, young person? You want your walk with God to be authentic and real and spirit blessed? You better be a biblicist. You better be a theologian. 
You better be someone saturated in the Scriptures because it says here, it's the Word of God dwelling in us richly that produces songs and gives us grace to sing in our hearts. I don't know if you heard the story of the pastor, the the lawyer, and the doctor who went deer hunting. And as they were in the woods, a large buck came out of the foliage and they, they kind of froze and then it froze. And in that moment, they all lifted their guns and shot at the same time and the, the buck went down. And they went over to it. They, 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 they started claiming it was my shot that killed it. It's, it's my buck. And as they were debating this, a, a, a warden came out and asked him what was going on, and it was explained to him. They were having a heated debate about who had shot uh, the buck and whose it was, actually. And the, the warden said, well, let me take a look. And he examined the, uh, the, the, the buck, and then he turned to the men. He said, I think it was the preacher that shot the buck. And the doctor and lawyer said, how do you know? And he says, well, the, the bullet went in one ear and out the other. And that's often the case. And Paul would would tell us not to indeed come to God's word lazily, haphazardly. That's the scriptures and the saints. Secondly, the the singing and the saints. As God's statutes become our songs, as we revel in the gospel, come to understand the Son of God through the word of Christ, it produces in us a desire to sing. And that's what we're told here. As the word of Christ dwells in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The word of Christ in the heart leads to the worship of Christ with the mouth. The Bible and the hymnal have always gone together in church history. Now, there's two things here about singing that I want you to quickly notice. I'm going to spend more time on the second thought than the first, but we could look at what I call the form of singing. What form did their singing take? Well, it's described for us. Three forms of singing, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, some commentators argue that there's really a distinction here without a difference. Paul is just piling synonym on top of synonym so we just realize, man, when you grasp the gospel, when the word of the living God is welcomed into your heart, it produces in you, it it, it brings about in you a desire to sing. Songs, hymns, spiritual uh, um, songs. And, And it's really a distinction without a difference. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think there is a distinction here. I think there's a variety of forms that are being described. I don't think worship here is monochrome. I believe there are different songs for different messages, different moments, and different moods. Um, Psalms, what, what are they? Well, clearly they're the Old Testament songs recorded in the Psalter, the Hebrew hymn book, 150 of them, inspired. You know, I hope you're not given just to singing contemporary songs. What are you going to do with the psalms that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old? We're meant to sing the psalms. Now, we don't have to become like Scottish Presbyterians who only sing the psalms exclusively, and they do it without instruments. I've been in their churches in Scotland where a a, a man will stand up and blow a little pipe organ and get everybody on the same kind of note, and then off they go singing a psalm. It is a beautiful experience to hear heartfelt a cappello singing in an old stone church. But, that, but it's more than that. Then you've got hymns. And from what we can tell, hymns would maybe describe something a little bit more theological. Um, it might be we believe like John 1 or Philippians 2, we believe that Portions of those scriptures are are so melodic and poetic that they may be sections of ancient Christian hymns. But but hymns tend to be a little bit more didactic and and confessional and theological. 
And spiritual songs, most commentators believe, they may be songs just in an act of worship that are spontaneous and spirit-produced. Spiritual songs, songs produced by the Spirit. Either way, I think there are different songs that have a different emphasis, maybe even a different mood that allow us to give expression. Sometimes um, we need songs that are reflective and quiet. Sometimes we need songs that are boisterous and celebratory. That, that's why at our church, at Kendrick Community Church, we have chosen a blended style of worship. And we didn't just choose that pragmatically to keep old and young people together. We chose that pastorally because we believe it's biblical. There's not one style of worship in the Bible. At times the Bible says, you let the earth be silent. That can be an act of worship where you just sit in silence. And reflect on your heart about the greatness of God and tremble at his word. But other times it's time to shout and sing and celebrate God's goodness. Um, so we have chosen a blended style where we use different songs from different eras to express different moods. That's why I'm saddened, frankly, to see churches divide over worship styles where you might have a traditional service in the morning for the older folks and later on a contemporary service for the younger folks. I'm just going to be honest. I, 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 I hate that. We're dividing the body over worship styles and our favorite type of song and style of singing when the New Testament church incorporated it all, it was blended and it was balanced. And it was congregational. Together it was unifying. They didn't split up generationally to worship God. They sat together as the body under the exposition of Scripture. And then together they sang different kinds of songs and different kinds of styles. Catering to styles of worship is nothing I see that the Bible endorses. What about the function of singing? The function of singing. I'm going to try and move this quickly, but, but, but here I'm talking about the reasons to sing. I mean, P Paul commands them to sing. And he's talked about the form they can sing with, and now he talks about the function. Number one, it's an act of association. I've, I've kind of said this, but I want to double down on it. Singing expresses unity, plural you. And then it says, admonish and teach one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. The, the believers were to teach and admonish one another through singing. By the way, if you're going to teach one another through singing, some of your songs definitely need to be theological confessional hymns. Not just a 7-11, right? You know, seven words sung 11 times. That won't teach you or admonish you. you you'll notice it's the plural. This was, this was to unite them around Jesus Christ and their common passion for him. I like what Bob Coughlin says in his book on worship. Paul uses the musical term harmony three times in his letters. In each case, he's not referring to music. He's describing relational unity. While gathering together in itself is an expression of our unity in Christ, singing together is an opportunity to deepen that expression and experience. How interesting that Paul, in his letter to the Romans and elsewhere, uses a musical term, harmony, to describe unity. And that unity is expressed when we sing together, young and old, new believer, mature believer, exalting Christ. Look, you know this, sociologically, let alone spiritually, songs bring people together. We love to sing together because it makes us feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. That's true even in the, the pub songs that you'll find people singing in Scotland and Ireland. 
You'll find it in the war songs that soldiers sang together as they marched to the battlefield. You'll find it in sports arenas. I remember once being in Anfield, which is where Liverpool plays, and hearing them sing, you'll never walk alone. That's an, almost a spiritual experience. 10,000 of fans are singing that together. Is that not the role of a national anthem? You know what? Songs are flagpoles around which people gather. And that's true spiritually. Songs are the glue that hold communities together, fan bases together, nations together. I forget who it was who said, you can write the country's laws, I will write the country's songs. They're so influential. It's not only an act of association, it's an act of affirmation. You'll notice here that um, we're to teach one another and admonish one another with songs, doctrinally substantive songs that educate God's people. Singing ought to reinforce theology. Singing allows us to own and express the Word of God and tell the salvation story. In Psalm 96 and verse 2, here's what the Bible says to kind of reinforce this thought. Sing to the Lord, bless His name, proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. I'm not arguing we have to have hymnals, but I remember when I was growing up as a young Irish Baptist using the Irish Baptist hymnal, and one of the things that struck me when you went to the front of it, there was a section on God the Father and hymns appropriate to that. There was a section on God the Son and hymns appropriate to that. There was a section on God the Holy Spirit, hymns appropriate to that. There were songs on the attributes of God. There were songs on the love of God, the grace of God, the second coming. Hymnals we're put together on categories of theology. And I think we miss something of that. And if we're not going to use a hymnal, that's fine, but we've got to find ways where our songs are teaching theology and explaining the gospel and reinforcing great redemptive truths where they allow us to tell the story of salvation. As I said earlier, John 1, verses 1 to 18, Philippians 2, 6 to 11, maybe Colossians 2, verse 15 to 20, are all believed to be early Christian hymns, doctrinal positions put to music. Singing used to be a teaching tool. We, we, have, we have made it into some emotional high but it's a teaching tool. Just another way to hear the word of God and the great truths of the faith. That's why we need to remind ourselves not to allow emotions to dominate because singing's about teaching and admonishing one another in the word of Christ. That's why we need to remember that you, you can no more sing heresy than teach it. That our, that our songs have got to be theologically correct. That's a reminder why we sing biblical songs and full of Scripture. If you study the Protestant Reformation, it, we're so used to it now, but congregational singing got lost in the Middle Ages with the domination of the Catholic Church and sacramentalism and a priesthood where people came and they were led through a service in which they had very little participation. Then the Gospels rediscovered, and the Protestant Reformation brings about the rediscovery of the priesthood of all believers, our blood-bought right to approach God and sing to Him and worship Him and study the Bible for ourselves. And so congregational singing marked Protestant churches. And Luther wrote hymns to go with his preaching. And some of his Roman Catholic critics said this, that Luther's songs have done more damage than Luther's sermons. Because his songs were theology. And people sang them and the word of God dwelt in their heart richly. 
an act of association, an act of affirmation? What about an act of amplification as we kind of close this section? Now, while I've kind of reminded us to be guarded about emotion, make sure we worship God with our mind before we worship with our heart, our minds must inform our hearts. I certainly want to embrace the idea that indeed our singing ought to provide emotion, an outlet for our emotion, for our passion. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. My mind, my heart, my strength given to worshiping God. And singing gives us the ability to um, amplify our emotions, to give an outlet for our affection. Because we tend to praise what we enjoy, you know? If I have a favorite sports team, I'll talk about my sports team and I'll get excited about it. If I have a favorite restaurant, I'll tell people to church, you got to go there. The food's fantastic. We tend to extol what we enjoy. And it's true in worship. If we enjoy the Lord Jesus, so we love him, and we're amazed at his grace, we'll extol that and we'll extol it with passion. You'll notice here that we are to sing to one another in, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you go to Ephesians 5 verse 19, which is an echo of this passage, we're to make melody in our hearts to the Lord. I love Psalm 45 verse 1. Speaking about the marriage of the king, and the psalmist's excitement about the marriage of the king, he says this, my heart is overflowing with a good theme. And that should be true of you and me in worship. Our heart should be overflowing with the good theme of the gospel. Have you ever got to a point in a worship service where, where your thoughts are so deep and your emotions are so strong that you don't know how to express them? That's what I love about songs contemporary or ancient hymns because the hymn writer gives me words that I can't find myself. He helps me clothe my emotion in language. And, and that's the beauty of singing and expressing our emotion and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And, and by the way, singing not only allows our emotions to be voiced, Singing speaks to our emotions. Singing and musical worship act as a spiritual repair shop to fix the wounded heart and the feeling spirit. Have you not gone to a worship service discouraged, down in the mouth, a little beaten and battered by the world, and found yourself lifted and encouraged? Remember um, King Saul? was depressed and how he would bring David to play and sing for Samuel 16 verse 23 and his spirit was lifted. Paul and Silas, Acts 16, in jail, but at midnight they sang hymns. Songs can do that. Songs can lift our spirits. In fact, the soul Good music, good singing affects the soul in a good way. I think, you know what? Maybe this explains something beyond natural ability of why black churches sing better. You know why? Maybe a thesis here we're thinking through because their songs are born out of suffering. And those songs had meaning. Swing low, sweet chariot coming for to carry me home away from all this suffering and strife and sorrow. If you study some of the books on slavery in the United States, you'll realize that some of the slaves sang in the wet blankets and in the water buckets. They weren't allowed to sing, but they had to sing. Their emotions had to find voice and their songs spoke to their emotions. Okay, let's wrap this up with the last thought, short 
We've looked at the script singing and the scriptures, singing on the saints, singing on the Savior. It's just, it's just this last little phrase here, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing on the Savior. See, the gospel is a word about Christ. And the saints of God who have come to put their faith in Christ sit under the exposition of that gospel. And as they hear it, it resonates with them as the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and indeed exalts the Son of God amidst the people of God. That's the worship experience. Worship's not a matter of self-expression. It's not about you. It's about the retelling of the glorious and gracious acts of God, especially in the sending of His Son in the gospel. It's about the death, burial, resurrection, and coming again of Jesus Christ. We're to sing about grace, through grace, in our hearts, to the Lord. Because the grace of God appeared in Jesus Christ, bringing salvation to all men. In fact, it's interesting in the Greek grammar here, there's a definite article in the Greek singing with the grace in our hearts to the Lord. We can sing about God's common grace, food, friendship, family, freedom, a week at Cannon Beach, but the grace That's the grace that saved us. That's the grace that reminds us we are a brand plucked from the burning. That's a grace that reminds us apart from God's grace and his sovereign love on us, we'd be on our way to hell and lost forever. It's that grace, that amazing grace that's so sweet in its sound that indeed brings us to sing. That's why John Newton wrote to him, Amazing Grace. Because every year on the anniversary of his conversion, the once-time infidel blasphemer and slave trader, now a minister in the Church of England, every year he reflected on that and was amazed by God's grace. And one, one year he sat down and wrote about it, and out came Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. When we have been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing his praise as when we first begun. His heart is bursting as he reflects on the gospel and the saving grace of God. It's not why he said throughout his life when he gets to heaven three things would surprise him. He'd be surprised that some of the people who are there, who he didn't think would be there. He says he thinks he'll be surprised at some of the people who won't be there, who thought would be there. But he said the biggest surprise of all, that he'd be there. Towards his life, when he was kind of just losing his faculties, he said this, I forgot a lot of things. But two things I haven't forgot. I'm a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. Father, we thank you for our time in the Word tonight. What a privilege to hear the Word of the living God. We thank you you have spoken, and that makes preaching necessary because preaching is speaking what you have spoken. And we pray tonight that the Word of Christ would dwell in our hearts richly. We'd make room for it. It would find a home in our hearts. We'd give it the run of the house. Lord, make us biblicists. Make us students of the Word. May we carry our Bibles in our hand. May we carry our Bibles in our hearts. And may the Word of God transform us and remind us of who we are apart from Christ, what we have become because of Christ, what we're yet to be in a day to come in the presence of Christ. We have a lot to sing about. The gospel informs us. Thank you for the forms of singing. Thank you for the functions of singing. Thank you for the focus of singing. The Lord Jesus Christ. 
Help us never to forget we're a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior, which should always produce a great song. And these things we pray in his name. Amen.